everyone, it's Hannah and Kaylin back again with another edition of Double Talk Asks. In 2009, author and researcher Fiona Broom was at a conference talking with other people about the tragic death of former South African President Nelson Mandela in a prison in the 80s, with specific memories of the news coverage and a speech given by his widow. The problem here is that Nelson Mandela did not die in the 1980s in prison. He passed away in 2013 at home. As Broom began to talk to other people about her memories, she learned that she was not alone. In fact, many others shared her same false memories. To learn more about the bizarre phenomenon, which she coined the Mandela Effect, Broom published a website detailing what she's learned while researching. The term the Mandela Effect is now widely used to refer to a situation in which a large number of people believe that an event occurred when it didn't. And as mysterious as the phenomenon is, there is a possible explanation through the science of human memory. Listen in as we call Elizabeth Loftus, cognitive psychologist and expert on human memory, about false memories and how they might explain the Mandela effect. A lot of people call when a large group of people have the same false memory, the Mandela effect. Why might a large group of people have the exact same false memory? The original Mandela effect where lots and lots of people believe that Mandela d died in prison when he didn't uh, it, it it may have started with a, a couple of people claiming it, you know, in, in media or social media, and other people then picked up the false information. Uh, I mean, it's hard to know exactly in that particular case, but that's only one example of a, a Mandela effect. There's so many other examples of lots and lots of people believing that something happened or something is is true when it isn't and I don't think they're all caused by the same thing. Is it a true false memory then? Because memory is when you recall something that actually happened to you but if people are confused because they saw somewhere else somebody claiming that something happened is that a false memory or is that false information? Like what's the difference between having a false memory and just thinking the wrong thing? When people develop this false memory it feels to them as if it's a real memory and they have great difficulty distinguishing which of these experiences are authentic memories and which are a product of some other process. So it, it's because it, it, it feels like a, a memory to the person who has it, even if it's inaccurate, it didn't happen completely wrong. Their brains are actually filling in images that they didn't actually see. It's the craziest thing. That's what happens uh, when, when you plant false memories in the minds of people. Many people will elaborate. They'll add new details and new information. What's happening is that they're, they're drawing inferences about what might have happened, what could have happened, and those inferences uh, can kind of solidify and start to feel like memories. What are some other popular examples that you can tell us about of a false memory? You know, there's one that 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 I kind of like, but um, it might you might be too young to appreciate this, but I'll give it a try anyhow. Mm -hmm. Let's see. <laughs> now, for comedians, um, George uh, Burns and Gracie Allen, and they were comedians long time ago, and they were very funny. They usually would end their little shtick with. Uh, George saying to Gracie, say goodnight, Gracie. What people remember Gracie saying is, goodnight, Gracie. But she didn't say that. She just said, goodnight. So say goodnight, Gracie. Goodnight. Goodnight. Why do so many people think that she said goodnight, Gracie, when, when she didn't? All she said was goodnight. And you can even Google and you could see these little clips of these two comedians and you can see that she says good night not good night gracie and and there i think gracie was always a kind of a little ditzy person maybe saying something silly like good night gracie would be the kind of thing a ditzy person would say and that's why that whole thing caught on that would have a, a very different kind of explanation than the typical Mandela example. People um, think things are spelled, certain products, famous products are spelled a particular way when they aren't. You never saw the package with the spelling of the product that way, but many people believe it that it, it, it was spelled that way. I know one of um, the product examples is a lot of people think Febreze has two E's, but it only has the one. My theory as to why that happens is because we say it Febreze and not Febrez. 
So I feel like maybe that's why. Yeah, it almost makes more sense. It almost makes so more just, sense. I think your brain just adopts the, the thing that makes the most sense to explain it to yourself. The Berenstein Bears. People say Berenstein, but it's really Berenstain. Mr. Rogers, he didn't say it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. He said it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. And you can play it over and over again, and it doesn't even sound like he said that. He, he says, in this neighborhood. It's crazy. Mirror, mirror on the wall was magic mirror. Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? When I was looking into this, I heard there's this thing called false memory syndrome. I'm assuming that not everybody can just say I have false memory syndrome because they forget something. You're getting into a, a kind of a hot topic. Um, this particularly emerged in the 1990s when we saw lots and lots and lots of people going into therapy. They, they would go to a therapist, maybe they'd be depressed or maybe they'd be anxious, or maybe they'd have an eating disorder. And they would end up with a therapist who engaged in certain processes and procedures, and maybe imagination techniques that got them believing and remembering that they were sexually traumatized as children, that maybe they were raped for a decade and that they repressed their memory and now the memories were back. So these patients now had a new problem. This collection of traumatic memories, often completely uh, not corroborated, uh, they would break off uh, ties with their families. Um, they would try to get their family members or others from their childhood prosecuted or bring lawsuits against them. And an organization formed um, of these accused family members, these devastated family members, and some professionals who were concerned about what was going on in this, in this therapy and in this culture. And that organization was called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Um, there was a Berkeley professor, a well-known Berkeley professor, who defined of false memory syndrome as uh, this constellation of beliefs that you had these horrific experiences when in fact they didn't happen. So that's what false memory syndrome is all about. Uh, you know, I don't tend to use the, the term unless I'm talking about the organization because I, I don't need, I don't think you need to talk about a syndrome. It's just people can develop false memories or even just false beliefs that something happened to them, even if they don't have a sense of recollection. And we know that happens. And that's the kind of thing I've been studying for the, fa the past many decades. In that case where, like you mentioned, like I know you've done this research on sexual assault victims, um, or they, they have these stories about family members or somebody doing something horrible to them. How can you, because that gets into such an area where it's like, I know that trauma can make you forget. And it, how do you separate what's a real memory and what's not when you get into a topic like that that can be so traumatic? And how does that affect criminal proceedings? When I get involved in court cases where these kinds of accusations of massive repression uh, are playing a role, you know, I'm, I'm trying to analyze, you know, medical records. I'm trying to look at all the statements that somebody might make. Uh, I'm looking for changes in the story. I'm looking for, if they exist, examples of suggestive or problematic things that happen that could be responsible for the creation of false memories if the memories are false. I don't declare anybody's memory true or false because without independent corroboration, you can't know for sure. But I'm often you know, opposing some opposing expert who is willing to do the opposite and, and essentially say, I believe these memories are real. I believe they're real because she cried when she told me the story. Well, people can feel emotional about false memories. I, I think they're real because she was so detailed and confident. Well, people can be very confident and detailed about false memories. So those are not diagnostic cues to allow somebody to reliably declare that a memory is true or false. 
Hannah and I are really big into true crime, and I know you've been involved with cases like Ted Bundy, O.J. Simpson, Michael Jackson. In general, would you go in on the side of the defense or the prosecution? Well, in, in the criminal cases that I've, I've testified in, I've only once testified for the prosecution, and the others are, are for the defense. That makes sense. In the civil cases, it depends on the posture of the case. So uh, if, uh, if one side is challenging the memories of the other side or wanting to present an alternative explanation for a, a detailed report of a memory that, and that might be false, um, I could be on either side of that case, depending on the posture of the litigation. Now, back to the Mandela effect. I know, I mean, usually in casual conversation on internet forums and on Reddit and things like that, a lot of people say that they try to explain the Mandela effect with, oh, it's because of an alternate reality or a shift in a timeline or things like that. What are your thoughts on, on those kind of well, crazy I, theories? I, I look for, you know, explanations on Earth. You know, I think... A, a, a simpler explanation would involve some, some psychological process involving how we process information than something so esoteric as alternative realities. What do you think that we as people have yet to learn about false memories? What's the biggest thing that you're looking into right now that you think isn't entirely understood yet? The most important lesson to be aware of is that just because somebody tells you something and they say it with a lot of detail and they say it with confidence and they even show emotion when they say it, it doesn't mean it really happened. That you do need independent corroboration to know whether you're dealing with uh, an authentic memory or a memory that's a product of imagination or suggestion. When you hear somebody say something that you know is wrong, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're lying. A lot of people jump to the conclusion that they're deliberately lying. They could genuinely have a false memory. When I hear a story, for example, the famous news anchor, I don't know if you remember hearing about Brian Williams. He remembered that he was in a helicopter over Iraq, I think, uh, and it got hit by a missile. Well, that, that never happened. And so how did he end up with his memory of being in a helicopter that got struck by a missile? How did it happen? A lot of people thought he was a big fat liar and he just wanted to make himself sound interesting. I believe that he, he had developed a false memory and, and really believed that this had happened to him. I think it was a gradual process in his case because I did study from media uh, coverage the evolution of this missile memory uh, but he lost his job as the NBC nightly news anchor. You have to look at the two different sides and the, the different possibilities. I mean, obviously, I would imagine, like, the life that he leads makes it more believable. Like, if I were to say that I was, you know, in a helicopter and I was taken down by a missile, like, that would be... Well, that's why it's plausible to him that it happened to him. Yeah, because it's like, I mean, obviously, I would be lying because I don't do anything of the sort. But, like, if he's been in situations like that, it makes it easier to believe that it is a false memory. And I think that's a much more tolerant way to feel about other people. So when, when my friends or family members make mistakes, or even I make them, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, my first thought is it, it, it's a false memory. That means he's human.